Well, good morning, good morning. I don't know if you realize this or not, but it is a great day to be a great day. Amen? We are so glad that you're here with us this morning. If you're visiting with us, welcome to Spanish Fort Church of Christ. You are an honored guest. We are so thankful to have you here. If you're joining us on Facebook Live or YouTube later, if you're ever in our area, please stop by and see us. It's always, I, I don't know about you, but this Sunday just excites me just to get together with our brothers and sisters in Christ to worship God. It's just a special feeling that you cannot explain until you truly experience. And we have a wonderful, wonderful church family here. And I just want to say, guys, I love y'all so much. So if you will, let's stand in honor of the reading of God's word. And then Kyle will continue our worship. Verses 36, and it'll, I'll be reading out of the King James Version. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption.
pray. Father, we're so grateful to come together this morning to recognize how awesome you are, Lord, and to, to lift up your name in worship. God, we just pray that this worship would be a sweet offering to you. Lord, I pray that this church would have the wisdom and the discernment to continue to bring your kingdom, Lord. God, we're so thankful for how you not only provided for us, but you provided for us abundantly. Lord, and I pray that we would continue to respect that and be grateful for that. Lord, please be with us all this morning as we orient our worship towards you and our minds towards you, Lord. Father, thank you most of all for your son and for the forgiveness that we receive through him. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
Jesus and his apostles were together in one place to celebrate the Passover. At that time, uh, Jews had celebrated their freedom from Egyptian bondage with the Passover feast for over 1,400 years. And Jesus was about to make true freedom possible, that is, freedom from sin. And Jesus used these emblems, the bread and the wine, to help us remember the horrible price he had to pay for that freedom. You know, we learned a few years ago that uh, the self-reflection provided in corporate worship is difficult to re replicate in any other way. In other words, God wants us to worship together. So this morning, with all of us together in one place, let us stop and in our mind and spirit reevaluate our lives in light of Jesus' sacrifice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Bless this bread representing his body, bruised and pierced for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the forgiveness offered through Jesus' blood. Bless this wine in Jesus' name. Amen. time for the offering in Acts 14. May take a little bit. Paul and Barnabas visit Lystra. Now this city was in a region of beautiful fertile farmland in what is today South Central Turkey. And there Paul healed a man who had been crippled from birth. And when the crowd saw this, they sort of went crazy. They called Paul Hermes and they call Barnabas Zeus. So these are two big name gods in their pantheon of uh, false gods. And they tried to sacrifice to them. Well, Paul and them weren't having any part of that. And they responded pretty eloquently. And they said, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. You know, we sometimes fill our lives with worthless idols. We attribute our good fortune to false gods sometimes. Well, let's not forget that the one true God is always here for us, waiting and wanting to bless us. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us with everything we need. Guide us so that we give generously. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord, for loving me.
The story is told of Albert Einstein got on a train one day to go on a trip. And as he was sitting there with his stuff and he had things spread out and he saw the conductor coming down checking everybody's ticket. And so he begins to look for his ticket and he's looking in every coat pocket, every pocket he had and through all of his stuff and he could not find his ticket. And about that time, the conductor got to Albert, and Albert says, I cannot find my ticket. And the conductor kind of just laughed a little and says, Dr. Einstein, I think we all know who you are. And I'm pretty sure if you're on this train, you probably bought a ticket. You're good, sir. And the conductor continued down the uh, checking the tickets and everything and got down to about the end of the uh, car and turned around. He could see uh, Einstein still searching for his ticket. And so he goes back to him and says, Dr. Einstein, you're good. We, we know who you are. You're good. And he says, Sonny, I too know who I am. What I don't know is where I'm going. And I think that's how a lot of us 
are at times. We don't know exactly what's going on, and I believe this is the perfect description of our lives, even as Christians, is we just don't know, where am I going? What am I doing? Why am I even here? And what am I supposed to be doing? I, I mean, I think I know, but I'm not positive. And the result, when we don't understand this, is that we just begin to live life without a purpose. We live in a way that we don't have no direction, or maybe it's just that we don't know where our destination is. And sometimes it's kind of weird because maybe, maybe we know where the destination is, but we don't know how to get there. I'll give you a quick little illustration of that. Coming back from Arkansas last night, we, we come down uh, 49 and hit 98 and coming back in and hit I-65. And I-65, all of a sudden, it, it, on 165, it tells me that I'm going to go and hit Interstate 10 like I'm going to Pascagoula. I'm like, that's not the way home. That's the wrong direction. But for some reason, it had me go down, and I had to go down one, st or one exit and then t make a U-turn and come back. I, I was confused, but yet there was three cars in front of me that did the exact same thing. So whether or not there was an accident on the bridge that we normally come across or whatever, I knew where I needed to go, but I couldn't understand why I was going the direction I was going. And sometimes that's the way we are as Christians, is that we know where we should be going and we know the destination is heaven, but how do I get there? How do, what am I supposed to do as I'm going that way? And what I'm afraid of is... Sometimes we just don't get it. It's kind of like the song many years ago is that we're just going through the motions. And we're not understanding what our job truly is as a child of God. And I believe one of the problems is, is that we have failed to tell the difference between life before Christ and life after we put Christ on. Because it's two different lives. And if we get those mixed up, we could have some issues. I, I love uh, Charlie Brown. I love Peanuts comic strips. And one of them just made me think about what we're talking about here. And Linus is sitting there and he's reading this book. And he, he's sitting there and Lucy looks at him and he, he says, Lucy, I, I just, my mind is blown. I just read where the earth travels around the sun, or the sun goes around the earth one time, once a year, or the earth goes around the sun once a year. And Lucy's like, well, that's got to be a lie, because I thought the earth revolved around me. And sometimes that's the way we live our life, because we live in this me, 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 me kind of world. We live in a culture that it's all about what I can get. That I'm worried about me more than anything else. It is a, a, a culture of self-indulgence, if you will. Our lives are focused on our thinking. Our lives are focused on our desires, our dreams, and my priorities. And sometimes that's the way so many lives. Part of that, maybe, is not all our fault because it's kind of wired in our DNA, DNA sometimes. If you've ever had toddlers, and whether it's another child takes a toy away from them or if you take it away from them, it's not mom, dad, it's, it's mine. That's what comes out of their mouth. It's mine, it's mine, it's mine. And so that's the way so many times we live our life that it is all about me. But I want you to look with me in Ephesians chapter 2 because Paul in this text is going to spell out how our lives used to be before coming to Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2 beginning in verse 1. And it says, and you were dead 
Again, and you, you and I, were dead in our trespasses and in our sins, in which you once walked. Again, he's talking about this is what happened before you came to Christ. You once walked this way, according to the age of this world, according to the ruler and the authority of the air, the spirit is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we, that's every one of us, we all once conducted ourselves in the passions of our flesh, carrying out what is willed by the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now, I, I want you to notice carefully here, because before coming to Christ, you had a purpose. That purpose was to satisfy your own desires. That was your purpose. Because, again, it's a me, me world, and we thought, that's yeah, what can I get? How can I improve my life? How can I do everything for me? That was our purpose before Christ. And our purpose, again, surrounded Ourself around as we focus about our thinking, it was about our desires, our priorities. Again, we lived in this world that was all about me. But that should, or at least should have changed when we came to Christ. Because you go on down, that's Ephesians 2 verse 1 through 3, look at verse 10 there. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God has prepared a walk for us, a work for us to do beforehand that we should walk in because we are in him. Before it was about our desires, our priorities, our dreams. But now in Christ it's no longer about me. It's about what God has created me for. One of the ways to look at this is that God has reconstructed our lives for a purpose. I don't mean to go dark here, but I think it's important for us to think about this. When you take your last breath on this earth, how do you want to be remembered? And how you answer that says so much about what you think your purpose in this life is all about. In other words, what would you like to be written on your tombstone? That describes exactly who you are. How you lived this life that God has blessed us with. Now a thousand years after David, the king of Israel, Luke wrote about how David was remembered. This was in our scripture reading this morning. This is a different version of this, and then we'll look at the one that was read for us earlier. It says, now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. Another version puts it, and this is what we read this morning, and I think this one is so important. This is old school here. We're going King James Version here. It says, for David, after he served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep. And was laid up onto his fathers and saw corruption. Imagine that being inscribed on your tombstone. That you served the purpose of God in your generation. So let's, let's look at that a little different then. And we're imagining that be written on that. But can we say right now of where we're at in this life. Where you're at in your walk of life, it would be said of you, you serve God's purpose during your generation. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians that we should examine our lives. 
And some of the reasons that we don't like to examine our lives is because we know what it's going to tell us. And so when we look in the mirror and say, am I serving God's purpose for me during my generation? What would the answer be? If it's no, then here's the good news is you still have time to serve God's purpose. And we live in a world that is in desperate need of God's children living God's purpose. Because just as the first century church turned the world upside down, we can turn the world upside down by living out God's purpose in our life that God has given to us. And just to look Christ-like. In everything that we do. So let me give you three things. And this is on your outline. Three things for us to consider when we're talking about serving God's purpose. Serving God's purpose is essential to the body. Again, when we talk about the body, we're talking about the body of Christ. When God saves us by our obedience to his commands, he adds us. We, we read in Acts chapter 2 there that the Lord adds to the church daily as those who are being saved. So when we put on Christ in baptism, the Lord adds us to the church there. And one of the reasons for doing that is that we can all, every single one of us can experience the benefit of belonging because we are part of of the body of Christ. We've talked about that a lot. We, we, we spent a whole series on talking about unstoppable. We looked at the unstoppable body and how it takes all of us. We've looked at the last two weeks in 1 Corinthians. We looked in Romans 12 about being part of the body and how the body fits together, how the body works together. It seems to be important. And so we see that there's something there. And here's the thing is, you, each, every one of you, have a gift. We have all been blessed in so many different ways. We all have gifts. We have talents. We have resources. We have abilities. And as we talked about 1 Corinthians 12, Romans chapter 12, both explain that God has Filled the church with people who have been gifted in different ways. We're all different. Maybe some of our gifts, some of our talents and resources overlap, but we're all different. It's kind of like our fingerprint. There's only one. There's only one of you. And if you're not willing to be you and to do God's purpose that he has given to you, who else is going to do it? And so you're special. You're one in eight billion that's living on this earth right now. And if you're not going to do God's purpose that he's given to you, then no one else is going to do your part. And this is from the youngest to the oldest. Brother Mike, probably without a doubt the oldest gentleman that I did a funeral was 105 years old. Brother Mike, up to six months before he passed away, was still driving. And I'm not going to lie to you. We either left way before Brother Mike did, or we let him stay on the road for a little bit before we left. Because he had a caretaker, and his caretaker was legally blind. I don't know who was taking care of who, but they were a great fit to each other. But Brother Mike at the age of 105, was still doing his part. He says, God has blessed me in so many ways. God has given me a purpose. Until I take my last breath, I will be doing my part. Again, in Romans 12, verse 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, we see how the body, how the church works as the human body. The unity that we have as being part of the body. And there's diversity in all the parts and different roles in all the body. Back in the back tables, and I'll mention this again in a minute, uh, there are some papers. A few of you that uh, came in after service started may have grabbed them, but I waited to after service to put them on. It's called faith worksheets is what we're calling them. It's just an opportunity for you to grab one of these and things that you would like to volunteer to help with. 
We took the uh, uh, spiritual gift test last week. You should have been able to grade yourself and see what are some of your gifts and say, hey, this is what, yeah, I'm good at this. I love this and so forth. Well, here's an opportunity to let the leadership know. Hey, this is some of the areas I'd like to serve in. The first one there is dealing, I would like to participate in the Sunday morning worship. Uh, whether it's an usher collecting a collection, lead singing, present communion devotional, read scriptures, preach. And there's all sorts of different things. And even some areas back there where it says, I'm involved in these ministries that's not even listed on here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take these. And uh, this box will be back, or basket, will be back in the back uh, starting Wednesday or starting today. And all you got to do is drop your stuff in there. You put your name on there and everything. And these will be copies made. We'll make a database of this. And when somebody comes up, well, hey, you know, we could really use somebody with this. Well, we've got some people that says they'd love to do that. And the, all the sheets that goes to the right ministry leaders, too. Anybody that writes down things for the ladies, then these will go to the ministry leaders and the different ladies. Things with fellowship will go to the Grissoms. And so we'll look at different things there. But this is just a way because the leadership wants to know what you would like to volunteer in. Because what makes the church so special is the body and how we work together through our diversity, through our different gifts, through our different resources. And this is just an opportunity to say, hey, I'd really like to participate in this. And so I would encourage you to grab one. They're on both uh, tables on the back side and fill them out. And here's the thing, and I don't mean this, this is going to sound bad, but fill them out and bring them back either Wednesday or Sunday. Because if you wait much longer than that, you're probably not going to bring them back. So love for you to take that, write, sit down, pray about it, fill those out, and get them back to us. Because, again, here's a little insight. After we get them and we start seeing who sent them in, I may come and say, Mary Ann, here's your sheet. I never received one back from you. would love for you to fill this out. So if we can all fill them out, we can see some of that, and we want to put, and that, that's part of the job of the leadership, is to put people in the right position in order for people to succeed and to bring glory to God. Things that we're comfortable with, things that we're good with. You know, I, I am, one of the things that I hate more than anything is putting up sheetrock. I don't know if any of you like doing sheetrock. If... Uh, if Wes says, you know, or if John and John comes to me and says, okay, we got some work to do. We got to put up sheetrock. All right, I'll be there. I'm not good at it, though. Painting, I'm pretty good at painting. And so sometimes we don't know what people are good at. And so if we can put people in the right position, it will go a long ways. Because here's the thing, when we start looking at it, there's a purpose when all the parts come together and they perform their function in the body. A lot of times we say, well, I'm just a member of the church. We, we have lost the meaning of what it means to be a member of the church. The Lord adds to the church when you're saved. And then we say, hey, I would like to be part of this congregation here. And when you become a member, it's not because you pay your dues or you, you, you've had to fill out something, all of this. But you're becoming part of the body of Christ. And it takes, again, the whole body to truly function together. And so when you think of the body, think of family. Because the Bible uses it to describe our purpose in the terms of body of Christ. Here's on your outline, I believe. God deliberately created each of us to serve his purpose in a way that is unique to us. God never wastes anything. He would never have given you your talents, your gifts, your time your interests, your life experiences if he never intended for you to use them for his glory. You have been blessed for a reason. 
God has given you gifts in specific ways for a specific purpose, to serve God's purpose, to bring glory to his name, to reach this community, to reach the Gulf Coast here, to reach the world. Are you serving God's purpose? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18, we see that God has arranged the body to accomplish it, that what God wants to be accomplished. Membership in God's eyes is far different than what we see it. Membership of God's body is about importance. I don't know if anybody's told you this, but you are important. Each and every one of you are so important to the body of Christ here at Spanish Forge. And we all have a role. We all have value. And every single one of us can add a contribution to the purpose, to the glory of God here. Winston Churchill, he went to the coal miners during the war. And he says, you know, y'all have got to produce more coal. Y'all have got to do a better job of this. Y'all have got to get in here and you've got to get to work and, and you've got to do more here if we're going to win this war. And he went on to say, as on the screen, when we win this war, we will celebrate. We will cheer our na Navy as they guarded our seas. We will yell for the armies as they walked the long battlefields. And we will salute our Air Force that flew missions or their missions of bravery, shot the enemy from the sky. But we will also honor those who are unknown who will be asked what did you do and 10,000 strong you will say we dug beneath the earth to sure our victory there is no job that is too small every job every ministry is important to the church family here. Well, I, I only do, there's no I only do. You are doing something for the glory of God. You're using your talents, you're using your gifts, you're using what God has blessed you with to bring glory to Him. On your outline, serving God's purpose is empowered by His strength. Spiritual success is a combination of our effort and God's power. Every one of us, every single one of us have a weakness. In fact, we are a bunch of flaws and imperfections. Have any of you ever went into an as-is store? A few of us? There, there's one up in Scottsboro, Alabama. And it was, I think it was unclaimed baggage is what it's called. And you go in unclaimed baggage, and it has an as-is sign, though, on it. And I, I remember going in there one time, and I found, the, found these dress pants that I just absolutely love. They're my size. These are awesome. This is so cool. I bought them for $2. Carried them home. We washed them. We dried them. And Sunday morning, I got up, and I put my left leg in, and I put my right leg in. And I'm going to be honest with you. I paused for a minute because I thought something was wrong because evidently my right leg had shrunk. But the right leg was four inches longer than the left leg. But it came as is. And here's the thing. The person sitting next to you, the person that's sitting across from you, the person that's sitting behind you, in front of you, we all come with an as-is sticker. Because we all have our flaws, we all have our imperfections, and we all are striving to that day when we hear, well done, my faithful servant, when we all become perfect and we go home in Christ. But until then, we've got to understand, uh, we have flaws, we have imperfections. Maybe it's physical, maybe it's emotional, maybe it's spiritual weakness. But here's the deal, that God sees our weaknesses different than the way we see our weaknesses. We see them as a limitation. 
we see them in, in a way that just we're like, I don't know how God could do anything of this. But God looks at it and thinks, this is a way I can show my strength through them for my glory. You remember back in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 12, Moses and how God calls him to go to Egypt. He calls him to go and petition Pharaoh to release uh, his people. And immediately Moses begins to point out his weaknesses. He, he begins to say, well, I, I'm not very good at talking. You know, I stutter. I, I do, but what will I say? I don't know what's going on. But we read in Exodus chapter 3, verse 12. But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you to bring out the people out of Egypt. Moses saw the weakness, but God says, you know, my strength can be in you because I am with you. And so when we look at our weaknesses, understand your weakness is not an accident. God deliberately allows us to have weaknesses, I believe, in order to, in the purpose to demonstrate his love, his power, his strength in our lives. If public speaking was an issue, God would have never picked Moses for the job. If God only used perfect people, well, nothing would ever get done. Let's just be honest. Because there's none of us that are perfect. But are we willing to allow God to work in us? Because part of serving God's purpose is about allowing him to work through our weaknesses. You, you think about Paul. I, I think Paul was a great, great example of this. Remember he asked God to remove a weakness three times. He said, God, just I, I want it to be gone. But what did God tell him? He says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. You think about all the giants of faith. And I want you to hear me and hear me loud here because all of God's giants were weak people in the sense that they had weakness. They had flaws. Gideon's weakness was deep insecurities, but yet he was transformed into a mighty man of valor. Abraham's weakness was fear, but God transformed him into the father of the faithful. Peter his weakness was being impulsive, but God changed him into being a rock. John's weakness was arrogance, but yet God transformed him into being the apostle of love. But what happens is we use our weaknesses as excuses. I can't do this. Weakness is... Not an excuse. And we've got to stop using it as an excuse. Because here's the point. God is God. And if God says, and if you feel this urge from God, a prompting from God, whether it's uh, through circumstances or through brothers and sisters in Christ or through his word, through a message, through uh, the Lord's Supper, whatever it is. If you feel an urge that you're like, oh, God, I just don't know. God says, we've got this. You do what you can do and let God do what you can't do. And see what will happen. The last one is serving God's purpose is expected by the Lord. When we generally think of expectations in regards to living the Christian life, we think of um, behavior, we think of performance, and we turn Christianity into a list of do's and don'ts, or, or mostly don'ts, it seems like. But how I act, what I do, and both of those are important, but I believe this goes much deeper than that. Look again at our verse in Acts chapter 13, verse 36. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on asleep and was laid into his fathers and saw corruption. Again, how did David serve God's purpose for him? How did he do this? According to the will of God. That's, that's such a powerful, powerful thought. Does God, and here's the question that we have to ask ourselves, 
does God have a will for your life? Do you think that God has a purpose for you? Yes. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 17. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. There is nothing that happens in our life that is insignificant to God. And God can use all of it to shape it for service to him. Again, remember Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. Here's, here's what he's saying in this verse here. He, he's saying you're not just some assembly line product. That's not what you are. You're not mass produced to go out and to do all of this. You are custom designed. Each and every one of you are custom designed for a purpose to do the will of God. And again, if you're not willing to do it, there's no one else to do your exact purpose. And that purpose comes with an expectation. You remember the parable of the talents. The one that went and hid his talent. You lazy and wicked servant. So today, I, I, I'm just asking you to look at your heart, in your heart, look at your life, and understand that God has a purpose. You have a talent. You have a gift. These sheets is just a way to help the leadership to see some of the things that your desires for and things that you want to be involved in. And one of the things that made the first century church so powerful is, was everybody, everybody was about the Father's business. They all had a role. One of the things uh, Coach Vic will tell you and anybody else that's coach that you, you always tell your kids, know your role, do your job. Know your role, do your job. And when we all know our role and we do our job, an amazing thing is going to happen. You were created to serve God in your generation. One more verse. 1 Corinthians 2. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love each day we live should be a reflection of that verse. So that when our lives come to the end, that people, whoever speaks over our memorial service, can look and say, Verlin served God's purpose during his life. Phil served God's purpose during his life. Brown served God's purpose during his life. Are we living God's purpose? I'll close with this. I think I've said I'll close three times, so I guess I need to close. I'll close with this question. Are you ready to change? Are you ready to shake the world upside down? I don't know about you, but I am. Because here's what the world needs today is a revival. And the revival starts with us saying we were created for a purpose. We have been blessed with gifts. We have been blessed with talents. We've been blessed with resources. <laughs> Watch out, devil. Watch out, world. Because here we come for the glory of God. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for... Blessing us in the way that you bless us. Thank you for the talents and the gifts that you give us. And Father, as we look at this today, and as we continue to look at our hearts and see of how you have blessed us and how we have opportunities to serve you like never before, help us to be a true servant of yours. Father, make me, make us a servant just like Jesus. And help us to live out our purpose in our generation.
It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If we can help you, you can come as together we stand. We sing. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. There is only one God, there is only one King. There shine